Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Andrea Bernstein. I am a former business reporter and editor at KPCC, Southern California Public Radio. I'm currently the interim managing editor there, and I really appreciate you taking the time to be here for this panel. We have a great group of people here today to talk about immigration policy and the California economy. Immigration policy has become an urgent policy item in the United States and Europe, and it's no stretch to say that the national immigration debate may have significant impact on key industry sectors in California. To discuss these potential impacts, please help me welcome Gray Davis, former governor of California, and now at the local law firm Loeb & Loeb. Thank you. And Perry Wong, Managing Director of Research at the Milken Institute. <laughs> I'll move a little closer, you guys. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. I'd like to start off with you, Governor Davis. When you served as our state's governor, you made it a priority to improve relations between Mexico and California and to increase trade. Tell us why that was important to you and how that relationship is maybe now more fragile under the Trump administration. Well, Andrea, thank you so much for uh, moderating. Uh, so I got elected in 1998. In 1994, Proposition 187 was on the ballot. And it was seen by many people as divisive, particularly in Mexico, so much so that the California office was kicked out of its building because the landlord got three death threats. Uh, and the California office was basically on the run for about a year, had no place, place to locate. So uh, I knew the person running the office, and I determined that, among other things, I was going to go to Mexico within the first 30 days of my administration, meet with the president, Ernesto Zedillo. We had a very good meeting. I invited him, with the help of the legislature, to come to California, speak to the legislature. Hadn't happened in 50 years. We decided to meet twice a year. Uh, and that relationship continued with, with President Fox. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'll tell you a story about President Fox. Uh, so in my day, we did not have a mansion, and so there was no place to entertain the President of Mexico. My friend Ron Burko, I imposed upon him, doesn't live too far from here, to host uh, President Zedillo. So I meet President Fox, and he says, the first thing I want to do, Governor, is have a state dinner at Ron Burkle's house. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, there's a lot of people who would love to host it. No, no, I would like to have it at Ron Burkle's house. So that was clearly <laughs> important to him. So Ron was ki kind enough to host uh, another dinner. But my point is, relationships matter. This was important to him. Uh, Ron was generous enough to uh, host another dinner. And he brought Carlos Slim with him. He brought the heads of international companies. It was, it was a very good opportunity to begin trade and uh, expand our relationship. So uh, you start with that premise, and then candidate Trump comes along years later and starts talking about Mexican immigrants as rapists and murderers. So that's the direct opposite. You start insulting people. Name calling is never good. Uh, it's at least uh, uh, a step backwards, and in some cases, you know, humiliating. Um, and so I think we're going to have to work our way through this period of tension. Um, I'm not saying that. Um, I'm not saying that the President of the United States can't try and negotiate a better deal with Canada and NAFTA. If he feels we're getting the short end of the stick, God bless him. But that requires Canada and Mexico uh, signing on. But I just think when you're dealing with your neighbors, they should be dealt with, uh, with respect and dignity. I think you should deal with every human being that way. Uh, and I think that had a... Had a that was part of the reason uh, that our relationship, California to Mexico, when we were the number two trading partner, Mexico was our number two trading partner and became our number one trading partner when I left office. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit more about trade. Perry Wong, where do we stand with NAFTA currently? We know that the president um, has said he's not a fan of it. So um, where, what is our status now in the negotiations? Well, I think to sum that up, um, we created a we, I think loosely defined, uh, created more uncertainty uh, for business uh, because the last round of proposal, which was ended uh, several weeks ago, uh, literally put a sunset of proposing a sunset clause on the treaty. Now, this is 
somewhat odd when you sign uh, agreement with uh, your neighbors or nations, you have a sunset clause in it and saying if we agree by that time, we dissolve that treaty. That actually creates uncertainty. And a second, I think, uh, in the next round of talk, which is going to be, I think, uh, in about 10 days, less than 10 days, uh, would be a very detailed, very tenacious talk on technical contents, on how we define the origin, rule of origins. So uh, that's something I think the economists actually had great interest in, uh, or business as well. So as far as I remember, since I was an analyst in the 80s, uh, the pr auto production actually is crossing the border between Canada and Detroit continuously. So there is a very difficult, I think, a definition of who make what, because a, a transmission can be part one, can be assembled in Detroit, sent over to Windsor, come back in the afternoon, so to speak, then you add more. So that's how it was built. And now to the extent with the trade of, say, pig auto production again, may not be that big with Mexico, but in fact, we share a lot of auto parts. So by de redefining uh, uh, the, the trade agreement, say now not only we have to look at the North America content, but we actually have to look at the country origin contents. That actually goes back to the general trade agreement, which uh, in many decided that may not be a good way to measure flow of goods. Because one thing in the last 40, 50 years, if we actually measure the global prosperity, is that every nation around the globe actually takes some part of productions so that no one country, so a block the country, manufacture everything. So take iPhone, for example. That iPhone that we use probably touch at least 14 countries, easily identifiable. Uh, so finally being assembled in China. Is the Chinese make the iPhone? No. Actually, it's Californian, American, uh, Canadian, Singaporean, Korean, Japanese. So by bypassing the logic to just say, now I only want to measure Mexico against the US, and then all the balance is hinged on the two nations, which is kind of logical. So that actually presented a unique challenge to many of our companies, uh, from Apple to GM to Ford to, to everything that you talk about that we use every day. So that actually is where the uncertainty is now. So I wanted to talk a little bit about workforce. Uh, governor Davis, during your time as governor, you signed a bill right. that allowed unauthorized young people um, to pay in-state tuition at community colleges and the Cal States and some UCs um, instead of the out-of-state tuition, which certainly made college, higher education more affordable. And uh, many of those young people then also benefited from DACA, which allowed them to work in companies that they um, maybe otherwise wouldn't have been allowed to work in. DACA is now um, uncertain, the future of those renewals, and I wondered how you think that is reverberating around um, through businesses throughout the state? Well, first let me say I was proud to sign a bill by Marco Farbaugh. I think it was 2000 or 2001. Uh, and here are young, young students, many of them brought to this country uh, at a very young age, uh, getting into college on their own merit. But out-of-state tuition in California is basically double, uh, or sometimes more than double, the cost of, of community college, state college, and now the UC system. Do uh, the program now applies to all three. Um, so this seems to me, again, a way to encourage young people to continue their education and hopefully go on and be productive c citizens in our society. And many of them, as you s infer, ended up working in the sciences, technology, and the STEM courses. And I, if I may, I have a couple slides. I don't think people appreciate how dependent the United States is, but particularly California, on uh, foreign-born workers. As I say, many of them have become naturalized citizens. So. Um, you know, even doctors and physicians, uh, they make up about, uh, foreign-born doctors and physicians are about 39% of all the physicians. Uh, accountants, you're up to about, uh, uh, about the same number. Uh, nuclear engineers, you're getting close to 50%. Medical scientists, you're over 50%. Uh, hardware engineers, you're over 60%. So th the STEM courses and the STEM businesses 
really rely on high-skilled workers that come to the United States. And if we don't allow them to participate, um, it has an has a effect on the state GDP, the U.S. GDP, uh, the number of jobs available, and how much they're paid. Let me see if I can go to the next. There we go. So um, this is just, so 18% of the um, Fortune 500 companies in 2010 were created by immigrants. They generated 1.7 trillion, employed 3.6 million worldwide, and one out of 10 workers in that year uh, uh, worked for a uh, immigrant-owned business, one out of 10 workers in America. Now this next, so here are some examples. Uh, uh, Jerry Yang uh, started uh, Yahoo, uh, that employs about 11,000 people. Um, Pierre uh, uh, Omidir, pardon me? Omidir. Omidir started uh, eBay, thank you, 11,000. Uh, Andrew Grove, that, uh, from Hungary, immigrant from Hungary, uh, started Intel, that's 107,000 workers. Uh, Panda Express, at Andrew and Peggy Churn, that's 24,000. They live in Rosemead, they come from uh, <coughs> Minamar. Elon Musk, we just have down, um, um, we just don't have Tesla is 18,000, but right around the corner he's got SpaceX, that's another five or 6,000, and he's got a solar company, and he, it's his idea that Hyperloop thing, which is actually located in, Cal in Los Angeles. So there are many more jobs than at 18,000. And then Sergey Brin, one of the co-founders of Google, uh, that's 53,000. So, you know, that's a, an indication of the impact that th these folks have in creating jobs for folks who are already here that are better paid and uh, not only can they raise their family, but they can literally change the world with some of the products that are providing people around the world. Uh, now this is, I think, the most staggering figure. So I want to ask you what the fourth largest economy in the world is. Well, some people would say uh, Germany or uh, France, but actually, if the United States, you can see it way on the right, is, is uh, the high flag, is first. And then China, then Japan. But the fourth is the combination of Fortune 500 companies started by immigrants, 18%, and their children, 23%. Like uh, Steve Jobs was not an immigrant, but his parents were. And uh, Apple is obviously the largest company in, in the United States. Uh, so the combination of immigrants and the, the companies immigrants founded and their children founded is, was 41% of the Fortune 500 in 2010. 41%. And their gross domestic product is uh, 4 trillion, uh, 256 billion, et cetera, larger than Germany, France, and the United Kingdom. So when we say this country is a land of immigrants, we mean it uh, in virtually every field. Uh, I've showed some of this to you before, but in 2000, we had a lot of money because the dot-com boom, and we established four research centers. They're six-story buildings in most cases. Uh, the one at the bottom um, is in life sciences, QB3. They generate about $700 million of economic activity through startups um, uh, in the Bay Area, particularly in the life sciences. The Nanosystem Institute is about a five-minute walk from here. Uh, that's the bottom left. Uh, so. President Xi of China's science advisor spent eight months here. He loves this uh, facility, wanted to have President Xi come here. But unfortunately, there's no land at UCLA. We had to build the thing five stories or underground, so he didn't want to go through all that if there was an emergency. Um, then um, in San Diego, uh, medical imaging called Cal IT2. Again, London, Tokyo, and Saudi Arabia went there to see if they had the image. Uh, they, they had the uh, innovation gene, decided they did not, and just gave this institute money to do more research. And the one up top is in Berkeley, the Center for um, uh, Research in the Public Interest. This is why I have the slides here. That institute not only got $100 million to be built, as the, the other three, each got $100 million. But Wiley Dai, an immigrant from Taiwan, came to Berkeley in the 70s uh, and started Marvel Engineering. That's in the San Jose area employs about 6,000 people around the world, and gave $20 million with her husband for the naming rights of this building. So that is just another example of how immigrants not only help uh, chart the future for California and America, but enhance our way of life, whether it's research facilities, companies they start, jobs they create. Uh, am 
might be a, uh, yeah. Uh, so that, that is, you know, that, that is um, an indication of how involved we are with immigrants. So as it relates to DACA students, I think the best thing that people can do is to business, businesses and people representing the DACA students have got to lobby the Congress and have them understand what an important part they are in this chain of activity that helps generate uh, uh, our economy. And uh, even if you have no interest in technology, all the money generated by these companies that I uh, showed and many others goes to the general fund in, in Sacramento, which pays for your child's public school, pays for the roads, pays, pays for uh, everything that the state does. So we all have a stake in seeing young, bright people have an opportunity to stay here, work here, and invest their energies in things that are good for them and good for America. Well, I want to thank Governor Davis and Harry Wong. Uh, and we'll have you right back okay. in a bit. Um, but we're now going to do a swap and have uh, Maria Elena Durazo and Ileana Perez come up, and we'll talk some more. <coughs> So uh, Maria Elena Durazo is General Vice President of Unite Here, which represents 265,000 union workers in the hospitality industry in the US and Canada. And Ileana Perez is the head of Global Trends and Futuring at Immigrants Rising, a nonprofit that helps immigrant entrepreneurs. And she's also a research analyst at the Stanford Latino Entrepreneurship Initiative. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. So we were just discussing how Southern California's economy is so deeply connected to Mexico's and also the really important contributions um, that immigrants make to our economy. And Maria Elena, you've been working with and representing immigrant workers uh, for more than 40 years. In that time, we've seen six different US presidents. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how President Trump's policies in particular uh, are different uh, and particularly threaten immigrant workers? Well, um, I would say that uh, on different levels, there are a number of different ways in which this administration is very dramatically different from past administrations. First and foremost, very dramatically, I believe it's very racist in nature. Um, the, the, the way that immigrants have been portray portrayed by this uh, administration is something that we have never seen. It is clearly based on race. Uh, so, for example, both during the campaign and after the campaign, examples of immigrants that were highlighted by the Trump administration were all um, um, uh, victims of crimes in which Allegedly, they were committed by immigrants and undocumented immigrants. That's, the, that's what they want to project about who immigrants are in this country. Um, and every time there is a policy that's raised, that's, the, that's, the, that's what's given. The Muslim ban um, clearly did not pass legal muster because of its discriminatory nature um, and violation of the Constitution. So, those, that, that we have never seen in any of the previous administrations. Uh, and it is so divisive in our communities. It is very um, racial and racist in nature. So um, the other way in which it differs is that there's really no comprehensive thought as to all the pieces of the immigration policy and how it impacts our nation. So when you talk about, when you talk about the introducing the RAISE Act, that's about cutting legal migration. And it's about setting a completely different um, um, threshold uh, or requirements to be able to come into this country. So you get points. And the points are based on, do you speak English? And are you highly skilled? And that's what you get the points for. And that's who's going to be given the priority in terms of visas and, and, um, and green cards are coming into this country. Well, that makes no sense for the economy of this country. It makes no sense whatsoever. 
And just as Governor Davis just pointed out, all that's a that's a part of the picture of the immigrant contribution. But what about all the industries that rely on the immigrant workforce? And there are many, many industries. You can go from healthcare to construction to hospitality uh, to manufacturing, uh, all sorts of under other industries that are services. And I'm not just talking about you know a dishwasher. I'm talking about you know plumbers and pipe fitters. These are very skilled, skilled jobs. But that's not within the definition of what this administration is moving forward um, as far as, and again, that's legal migration. Um, that, is, that is very troubling, I think, to the businesses um, and uh, in this country that that would not, that, that the new system. It also goes against what our values as a nation have been. In other words, family unification is not there. Now, many, many decades ago, we had some immigration policies that did a version of that. You know, the Chinese workers were brought in, Filipino workers were brought in, and those were just come in, do the work as guest workers. You're not allowed to bring family. You're not allowed to be unified. Your family come in and work, and then you have to leave. But now we're talking about a complete different overhaul of what's being proposed by this administration. So it doesn't make sense for business, for our workforce. It doesn't make sense for our economy. Um, and again, it's completely changing everything. And the last part is the uh, kind of enforcement, detention and enforcement and deportation machine. So there's a big emphasis on um, going after uh, de detaining and deporting uh, immigrants, regardless of how many years they've been here, regardless of whether or not they have citizen-born uh, children here, regardless of whether they have legal residence in their family, is just uh, detain and deport. Um, and that's even worse for our communities. It's really terrible for what the values of this nation have been. And to say that family uh, unification, family visas, will not be uh, considered in terms of legal migration is just the opposite of what we have done in this country for, for many years. So um, the deportation machine of increasing um, um, the presence of ICE agents in the interior uh, for things like, imagine this, an ICE agent shows up in a courtrooms where there are witnesses to crimes but that's where the ICE agent is, um, is, are showing up. ICE agents at a hearing for uh, labor commissioner hearings where workers have filed complaints about wage and hour or other labor violations. That's where your ICE agent is. An ICE agent picking up a, a father, detaining a father who's taking his daughter to school, just blocks away from the school, stopping him, getting him out of the car, and, uh, and detaining and taking them in. That kind of cruel, cruel, inhumane way of doing detentions and deportations, it's what's coming out of this administration. So on many fronts, it is dramatically different from what's taking place, what has taken place in previous administrations. And I have not agreed with previous administrations and their handling of this, but it is dramatically different. I also wanted to talk about entrepreneurship in this panel because it's, entrepreneurship is such a big part of the immigrant experience and certainly we saw that in the stats that Governor Davis provided. Um, Ileana Perez, you work with immigrant entrepreneurs. Can you talk a little bit about why uh, starting a business is a solid route for immigrants in California? Of course. Um, so I run an initiative that encourages undocumented immigrants to earn a living and thrive through entrepreneurship in this country. So a little bit of history, uh, IRCA passed in 1986 established the I-9 system which requires a green card and legal uh, authorization to work as an employee in this country. However, it left out that independent contractors and business owners did not have to go through the I-9 system. They instead can fill out a W-9 form which specifically asks either for a social security number or an I-10 
number, which any immigrant, regardless of legal status, can get. So because of that exclusion within IRCA is how um, any immigrant, regardless of legal status, is able to earn a living and earn income for themselves. Again, they are not uh, getting employed um, by anybody. They are um, starting their own businesses um, and working as independent contractors. So the fact that that's uh, a possibility for individuals really, really um, just um, allows individuals to pursue alternative options without the fear of raids, without the fear of discrimination from uh, being immigrants, from learning a different language. Um, so that's really uh, been a pleasure to work with a lot of these uh, um, uh, both young and older undocumented immigrants. So in terms of the older generation of undocumented immigrants, oftentimes tend to be in, um, for example, landscaping is a big one. Uh, home cleaning are different types of LLCs or worker cooperatives that have been created. But on the other side of the spectrum, we've been seeing a lot of uh, younger individuals um, both undocumented and DACA recipients that have chosen to pursue entrepreneurship, uh, both as a way to apply their skills. Um, so a couple of examples of a few projects or individuals that we've supported. Uh, one is called the Family Reunions Project, which uses virtual reality to connect undocumented families who are in this country to their home countries. Uh, we also supported uh, Maria from Chicago. Uh, so Chicago legalized street vending, which allowed her family uh, to um, obtain licenses for them to, uh, to, co to continue to pursue their business. Business, and now her business is to encourage others to um, get the licenses, and she's also starting a shared kitchen in Chicago. Um, so it's really just to see that there, um, what excites me so much about entrepreneurship is that it really transcends across age, educational level, um, and of course, immigration status. So um, it's estimated that approximately 9.5% of undocumented individuals pursue entrepreneurship. Um, so we're, uh, we develop curriculum, we develop resources to help individuals think about the legal considerations, tax considerations of these opportunities. So my understanding of DACA is that if an immigration reform package is not passed, these renewals will expire kind of on a rolling basis. And young people who are in their 30s and 20s, maybe have gone to college, now worked for companies for years and years, will no longer be able to stay at the firms that have employed them. And I wondered, um, because there is this threat that that could happen, are they coming to you and saying, I might need to start a business in order to support my family? And I wonder if you could kind of talk sure. about that conversation that's, that's taking place. Definitely. So entrepreneurship opportunities have been available since, again, 1986. But um, I uh, became involved with E4FC more closely thinking about the curriculum and the resources back in November when Trump got elected. And the reason I jumped on board was exclusively because we knew that DACA uh, could get rescinded at that time and that we needed to um, educate individuals about alternatives to employment when work authorization expires. I am a DACA recipient. I only have a year left with my work authorization. Uh, so it's something that immediately I have to think about that I only have a year to think of my plan B, learn about these opportunities, and jump toward um, either becoming an independent contractor or starting my own business. But um, there are many individuals who will now lose their work authorization immediately, either because they were not eligible to renew their permits in the one month window that was allowed, or for whatever reason, it's estimated, estimated that about 20,000 um, undocumented youth throughout the nation did not get a chance to renew. So 20,000 young individuals will no longer be able to, uh, one, be employed at their home countries and also now have fear of deportation that immediately need to think about an alternative way for them to earn a living. Of course, if the DREAM Act does not pass in March, uh, then that leaves the rest of us, including myself, to have to think about an alternative, alternative way for us to earn a living. But expanding beyond that, uh, my parents are entrepreneurs, have been entrepreneurs for many years. So these are opportunities, again, that will fill a need immediately if the DREAM Act does not pass for individuals who lose work authorization. And then, you know, the rest of the 11.2 undocumented immigrants that really do not have another alternative. So um, obviously for the hundreds of thousands of DACA recipients, they are watching to see if an immigration reform package passes. Um, Maria Elena, what is the business community doing um, in terms of engaging with Congress on this? Well, I just want to thank Ileana. I, mm -hmm. I think it takes an extraordinary amount of courage 
for um, anyone with uh, that immigration status to still come and speak to all of you, uh, to do what she's doing. Um, and I hope that uh, you all are uh, walk out of here more inspired than before um, to do the kinds of things that, that she's doing. I, I, th I think you're an extraordinary young woman. Um, I would say with regards to you know the business, somebody broke this down, which was just amazing to me. It says DACA recipients with job forced job loss chart. How many DACA recipients? And they estimate about 75% of the DACA recipients have jobs. How many of them would have to be replaced? And for how often? It says per quarter after that. Per week, 5,447 per week. And then another, the next quarter would be 6, 000, almost 7,000 per week. The next quarter, 5,000 per week. The these next quarter, 9,000 per week. These are the rolling renewals expiring. The, this is what businesses and so many industries are going to be facing. And it broke it down by hour. How many people would have to be hired to replace the DACA recipients? If you add on to that, another 300,000 um, men and women who have been here for decades under the TPS, that means they came from certain countries. There were about 10 or so countries, some African countries, Haiti, and Central American countries that due to natural disasters which tore their countries up um, or civil strife, extreme violence, they have been allowed, one, to get their uh, uh, legal work permit and to be in this country and to raise their families. If you take all of that, 1.1, 1 .1, you know, 1, 1 1.2 million people who could overnight, literally overnight, starting overnight, would become undocumented and subject to deportation. So uh, businesses, I'm glad to say, are starting to step up to say to this administration, you're crazy. We cannot have a, a, the economy that this country has always had if you proceed along those lines. Now we're no longer talking about undocumented being subject to deportation and all the industries that they support. Now we're talking about those with a legal, have been legally here for decades and taking away their legal status and forcing them to go underground or maybe some of them would consider going back to their countries. But when you have a choice between getting killed, your kids being killed, and staying here and going underground, what would you do? What would you do in that situation? Most of them are gonna end up staying here and going underground. And that's not good for workers in this country, for their standard of living. It's not good for the wages that we all deserve. Um, so this is a very, very urgent matter. Already seven countries have been uh, stripped of their TPS status. Um, and starting next year, for example, two days ago, the announcement was made um, for Nicaragua. So there's somewhere between three and 5,000. That sounds like a small number, but when you begin to add it uh, uh, um, to the Haitians, which is between 50 and 60,000, and then you put Central Americans. These, these are numbers of people, human beings, uh, who have already invested themselves in this country. So business is starting to move up and, and step up. Uh, there is a coalition of businesses, the EWIC, uh, Essential Worker Coalition, that is starting to step up. We are reaching out in our industry to the hospitality employers, uh, hotel employers, and others to step up. But I believe in this administration, if business does not step up to bring some rational thought to this administration on immigration policy, we're all going to suffer tremendously. So we're making a call out at more business um, leaders to really step up and help um, change the direction in which this administration is going. So uh, I'd like to invite Governor Davis and Perry Wong back to the stage. I have a final question for you all. <laughs> I hope it's not a surprise. <laughs>
<laughs> it's not a surprise. Change shares here. <laughs> so, you know, we've been talking about uncertainty in California's economy and how trade policy and immigration policy is somewhat up in the air. Um, in my reporting, when I've talked to many businesses, the common thing that we hear over and over again is, well, we're going to wait and see, you know, or, oh, we're in a holding pattern. You know, they don't, that, that, that they're kind of holding off on growth um, because they just don't know what's around the corner. And so, in a few words, I was hoping that each of you could tell us what you think state leaders, business owners, um, and workers can do to prepare for this potentially rocky future. Uh, well, let me just say, uh, the legislature and the governor uh, passed three or four pretty important bills, the Sanctuary State Bill, which keeps, uh, makes it illegal to, um, for a police officer to ask immigration status. This is, by the way, all police chiefs believe they cannot solve crimes unless witnesses come forward and testify. They can't get witnesses to testify if they're worried about their you know, deportation, uh, deportation and their, uh, their legal status. So they feel very strongly about that. The governor did have you know, several hundred uh, cr criminal felonies, which if you've been convicted of them in the last 15 years, you're not covered by that provision. And then there was another bill passed that said um, local governments put a moratorium on local governments uh, signing up more uh, detention centers uh, where presumably people go uh, if their status is, is uncertain or they're about to be deported. Um, and then um, uh, there were a couple other provisions that the, the, the state enacted, uh, including financial support for uh, DACA students so that they get representation at every step along the process and their rights get fully exercised as opposed to missing a, a window where you have to apply, uh, which would not happen. The UC is part of that and there's some private institutions that uh, very much help that. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, um, this country has to realize it has a heart. And if people, particularly the DACA recipients, came here, not of their own volition, the parents, they're two years old, they're three years old, they're an infant, they're five or six, they're not debating their parents, no, I don't want to go, they don't get a vote, they go. And then they make the best of, of their opportunities here, they're contributing to our economy, and then we say, you have to leave. That's like cutting off your arm or your hand. Why are you doing that? It's stupid. Uh, how are you gonna replace those people? What's gonna happen to them? A lot of turmoil, so bottom line, Everybody with a heart and everyone with a business has got to find out how does this affect me? How does it affect my customers? I have to communicate that to my congressperson, my, um, uh, if I know anyone in the Trump administration, that you, your policy is hurting my neighborhood, my business, my customers, uh, and I don't, I'm not gonna stand for that. There's gotta be a better way we can resolve this issue than kicking out tons of people without realistically having any opportunity to replace them uh, for years and years, because you have to train people, you have to find them, you have to bring them on board. All that is um, unnecessary if, if DACA is extended in a humane and, and thoughtful way. No one is asking uh, uh, that there, there not be conditions uh, applied to their remaining here and, and uh, hopefully having a path to legal status and maybe legal citizenship, uh, but Kicking them out will be disruptive to them, disruptive to businesses, and disruptive to America, and not what uh, the Statute of Liberty, not to signal the Statute of Liberty sends the world, just the opposite. Ileana Perez. The number one thing right now, we need a solution for the DACA issue. So the very first thing would be a clean DREAM Act to, to protect the, um, uh, the DACA recipients that will be um, losing their work authorization over the next few months. That's the immediate need. Um, DACA, while it was an amazing program that I definitely benefited from, benefited from was a short-term solution that left many of us in limbo. Uh, we have fingerprints, every single piece of personal information is in the system. Uh, we trusted the government with that kind of information with, I have addresses for my parents, previous homes, so that needs to be immediately fixed. Otherwise, had we known that this would happen, none of us would have even put ourselves at risk or our families at risk. 
So the California, uh, so definitely the Dream Act would be the number one. Um, just uh, uh, also related to that in terms of our experience as DACA recipients is that for the first time we were able to get benefits. We were able to get retirement ac accounts. I was ready to help my parents purchase a home without uh, the security of knowing what's going to happen to us over the next few months. We're now choosing to save our uh, save our money and figure out, come up with a plan B to figure out if we do get deported, then we need to have some savings in the bank to be able to go back to Mexico and start a business somewhere else. So in terms of maybe the human side may not necessarily resonate with a lot of people, but there are economics to back up um, all of what we're advocating for. And secondly, a larger, more intelligent, comprehensive immigration reform. I mean, immigration is not going anywhere. Uh, it's not just a Mexico-US issue. That's this right. is worldwide. Right. There are many reasons why individuals have to move That's across right. countries. Um, so we have to just come up, get together, and think of more intelligent, strategic ways to think about how we're going to deal with the current immigration problem and with the future of immigration in general. And Mary Elena? Oh God, I cannot <laughs> imagine not having you in our country and the benefit of this young woman. Um, and you know, the, 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 the uncertainty is so highly damaging not just the threat of it, which is very emotional. Imagine what these families are going through, uh, but the reality in our neighborhoods. Um, just, you know, half the workforce in LA County is foreign born. About 10% is undocumented. So let's say 900,000 undocumented in LA County. There are 800,000 U.S. citizen family members living with them, okay? In addition, another 250,000 green card holders, legal residents, also family members living with them. So you have just in L.A. County, two million people who will be directly, personally impacted by the immigration policies in this country. If you do that to, on the statewide basis, all of that adds up to about six million people. They are our neighbors, our community. They work for us, they work next to us. They are everywhere because their families are such an integral part of our society. You can't just separate them out and push them over there in the corner. They're part, they literally are part of our fiber. So an uncertainty for that many people and the people they work with and work for, the schools that they go to, the children who are their you know, classmates, would be, is, is gonna have a devastating impact and we cannot live under that kind of uncertainty. If I could just add one thing about the schools before we get to Perry. So, Roughly 12% of uh, public schools in California uh, consist of uh, undocumented immigrants. So that, that's 12% of 6 million, that's six to 700,000 kids that are worried about a parent uh, or an immediate relative who could be deported. So, I mean, you're a child and you're trying to cope with school, maybe cope with the new language, uh, you know, learn, prepare yourself for life, and you're worried about someone you love being yanked out of your life. So that, that's the real world these, these kids are facing, and all that gets decided sometime between now and March 1st. I'm sorry, Perry. That's right. Okay. Perry um, I, I think we really, as a society, have to recognize that our prosperity actually really rely on three things, and mo mobility of three things, uh, information plus knowledge, uh, capital movement, um, and lastly would be mobility of human capital. Uh, in many ways, I think other than some exception in the war zone area, migration is more economic than anything else. Mm -hmm. So people pursue economic opportunity. So we have to recognize that. Um, by punishing those who have come here, mm -hmm. do us no good. Uh, if the president and administration is proposing to bring jobs back to America, if that's the case, we are already having a very tight labor force or labor markets. Mm -hmm. So say if President Trump is so successful by bringing five million jobs back to U.S. Where are we going to find the workers? So that's reality. So let's let's face that. And my second point, I think, recommendation to the state government or, or, or local government, is education. 
regardless whether they are immigrants or not immigrants. I think we should not draw that distinction. After all, they are all human capital stocks. That's for our future. So let's make sure our training, our education, do their proper job. So I also recognize, I think, the sentiments. I think we all pin this on, on President Trump. But after all, he was elected by the agenda he proposed. And mm -hmm. fair amount of people somewhere in the country voted for him and agree with them. So there are disadvantaged groups in some communities. So we do have to recognize that. And if you look at some of the recent study in economics, uh, the number comes up to be to the society, uh, the competition with the new immigrants actually do punish the existing uh, least educated uh, workers. So we do have to recognize the sentiment there. So that goes back to the government. And, and, and Governor Davis, this is one thing that you said absolutely correct. You said it 20 years ago, you repeat it today. It's education and workforce. So let's pay attention to that. So not to point finger and say, be, my life is miserable, be, be miserable because of immigrants. Uh, we highlighted many, many uh, uh, well-known immigrants, and they, they brought tremendous value to our society. So I think let's stop thinking about that, but at the same time, I think we do have to think about people at somewhere disadvantaged position. Uh, so we do have to help them, whether they are immigrants or otherwise. We have just a little bit of time for audience questions. If any of you would like to ask a question to the panel, please raise your hand and someone with a mic will come, come by. Make sure to keep your question brief so maybe we could get two, two in at the max. Um, great, tell us your name and where you're from once the mic gets there. Here we go. Your website. Oh, I'm Caroline Walker. Your website? Uh, we're immigrantsrising.org. Immigrantsrising.org. Correct. And the, the second. Okay. Is there any others? Oh, yeah. oh here. Okay, I'll go. Uh, Krishna Thangavelu. Um, I just want to raise awareness that by 2030, most of the boomers are going to age out of the workforce. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of forgotten that we need workers. Mm -hmm. Is the government aware that, that, that <laughs> this is going to happen in like 15 years? Why are we sending our people away when we need workers? And we're certainly at, at full employment right now. Perry, well. Perry, is that something you're aware of? This, this, uh, well, I think I would quote Steve Palmer's uh, famous statement from the morning, you don't want to do forecasts. But one thing we do know, uh, I think, uh, that artificial intelligence would provide some of the answer. We look at actually how the Japanese economy is dealing with uh, their uh, extreme constraint uh, workforce. Mm -hmm. So there are ways of doing it. Uh, however, I agree with you. I, I think with the certainty that we are all live, going to live longer uh, and, and perhaps need some younger hands. Uh, so there is too, too much of uncertainty to say based on aging society, so we need more worker. I think that will be too uh, deterministic uh, from my perspective. I want to thank all of our guests today and give a special thank you to the Milken Institute and KPCC's in-person team. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you.